Guan Yu was born in Unchang in Shanxi province, rising to fame as a general fighting for the state of Shu. Of all the heroes of the Three Kingdoms, he is perhaps the most iconic. Yet strangely, in Records of the Three Kingdoms, though noted for his bravery and loyalty, he's a relatively minor figure, mentioned only in passing. But in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it's different. Here, Guan Yu is described at length and in detail, acquiring the features that have almost become his trademark. The booming voice, the long beard, the upturned eyes and arched eyebrows, the brown weather-beaten face. And stories about him are not just preserved in works of classic literature. Countless folk tales about him survive too, passed down the generations for almost 2,000 years. What's more, there are probably more statues of him than any other historical figure. No wonder people in China have such a clear idea of Guan Yu, the brave, loyal, kind, and just general. In 1724, dozens of merchants in Shu Shijian in Hunan province gathered at the temple of Guan Yu. 
They were here to discuss an important matter affecting the reputation of all members of the business community. There had been accusations of unfair trading. Unscrupulous merchants were using steel yard balances of varying sizes in order to deceive their customers. Therefore, publicly, in front of the statue of Guan Yu, they undertook to adopt a standard steel yard and agreed that anyone found using a non-standard one to deceive customers would have to pay out of his own pocket for an opera troupe to entertain the whole town for three days. 20 years after this gathering, merchants hailing from Shanxi and Shanxi expanded the Temple of Guan Yu in Shu Qi Dian into the Guild Hall of Shanxi and Shanxi. Over the next 136 years, it was expanded yet further. By 1892, it was the largest Shanxi and Shanxi Guild Hall in the country. During the Qing Dynasty, Shanxi merchants prospered setting up shops throughout the country. Far from home, it was natural for them to look to Guan Yu, their province's most famous son, for spiritual support and guidance. So it was that Guan Yu temples became the focus of community life for Shanxi people, plying their trade far from home. Places to meet and make connections. Places to come in times of need. As guild halls sprung up around these temples, Guan Yu came to symbolize the fair dealing and honest practices of the Shanxi merchants, the god of fortune that had blessed their endeavors with success and prosperity. Chinese 中国人把它奉为财神的目的是想取一个诚信在生意场中国传统的一个训诫叫义内求财生财有道义内求财也强调一个义字于是人们也就把关于呢因重义重情奉为财神The Temple of Guan Yu in Yunchang, Shanxi Province, is considered to be the earliest of its kind in China. The four characters hanging in the main hall were written by Emperor Kang Shi of the Qing Dynasty in praise of Guan Yu's uprightness and loyalty. To the rear of the temple is the Spring and Autumn Tower, which houses a statue of Guan Yu, reading Zhou's commentary on the Spring and Autumn Annals. It is said that Guan Yu liked reading Zhou's commentary and knew it by heart. Even before Romance of the Three Kingdoms was completed, the image of Guan Yu reading Zhou's commentary on the spring and summer annals by candlelight was already quite firmly established, having appeared in verses dating from the Yuan Dynasty. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, spring and autumn towers were added to many Guan Yu temples. Nowadays, there is no Guan Yu temple, incomplete without a spring and autumn tower, containing a statue of the great man reading that classic work by candlelight. How did that come to be? First, we Kong 
Guan Yu's decapitated head was interred in the mausoleum of Guan Yu in Luoyang. There are four large characters written on the gate of the mausoleum, proclaiming the virtue associated with the great man, loyalty, righteousness, benevolence, and bravery. For over a thousand years now, Guan Yu, a general of the Three Kingdoms period, has symbolized these values to countless worshippers. But what exactly is righteousness? As Confucius pointed out in the Analects, the superior man, the ideal gentleman, would put righteousness before any other consideration. In that sense, righteousness is the quality that defines nobility, that demonstrates a person's superiority. The essence of righteousness is that a code of conduct shapes and guides a person's life. Confucianists praise Guan Yu as a saint because they saw him as an exemplar of righteousness. Reading Zhou's commentary on the spring and autumn annals at night came to symbolize Guan Yu's righteousness, his dedication to Confucian ideals. The emphasis on righteousness is sufficiently reflected in Oath of the Peach Garden, the first chapter of Romance of the Three Kingdoms. In the novel, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei became sworn brothers in the Peach Garden on the day after they met. The famous saying has been passed down since then. The saying goes, we seek not to be born on the same day, in the same month, and in the same year. We merely hope to die on the same day, in the same month, and in the same year. In the three 却并没有刘官让三人举行结拜举行结义的这样一个形式，只是说他们三人关系很好，恩若兄弟。当兵在的时候出现了资本主义社会的蒙压，就有大量的农村人口涌入到城市，当城当城市平民、城市工人，中国
，这个无论是这个小说还戏剧各种形式的这个这个关羽的形象，就开始更为明显的跟忠义这个价值观相挂钩。之前其实并没有强调这一点，就从南宋开始特别强调这个，这跟整个中国文化的走势实际上是相关联的。所以说呢，后来呢，关羽就越来越这个成为一个，就是中国人中医观当中的一个非常理想化的一个人物，或者说他是中国中医观的一个一个代表性的人物。The romance of the three kingdoms was so popular that countless people were inspired to emulate its leading characters, especially Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei. Indeed, even emperors were inspired by the book. For example, the Manchu warlords who founded the Qing dynasty were big fans of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms even before they took power. In 1639, Huang Taiji ordered the novel translated into Manchu, his mother tongue. It took more than a decade, but by 1650. The Manchu language version of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms was complete. According to historical records, Emperor Shunzhu of the Qing Dynasty became sworn brothers with some Mongol chieftains, referring to himself as Liu Bei and the Mongol chieftains as Guan Yu. Some historians argue that this Three Kingdoms-inspired Qing policy pacified the Mongol tribes. Ensuring that they were content to remain on the northern fringes of the country for more than 200 years. 从小说的宣扬里面，把义的东西提高了很高的层面了。再就是把忠的东西，在我们看一部小说里面就宣扬了一个所以最核心的东西，忠是第一的，在忠的旗号下就是义是第二的，义是第二的。我们看看，加上他的勇，加上他的仁仁慈，你看他那个那个把不是曹操杀了在呃在华容道上啊，截杀不截杀曹操的时候，最后把他放了。哎，也表现他的仁义，呃，仁和义，当然也讲了他的承诺，信守信，这是最典型的一场
In the novel, the Allied forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei attack Zhao Cao's army with fire in the Battle of the Red Cliff. Defeated, Zhao Cao was forced to flee, eventually running into Guan Yu's army. His army demoralized. Zhao Cao had no choice but to beg Guan Yu for mercy. As he'd treated Guan Yu with courtesy previously, he had high hopes that Guan Yu would release him. Guan Yu answered that killing Yan Liang and Wen Chou and breaking the siege of Bai Ma more than repaid Cao Cao for his kindness. So to begin with, he refused to let Cao Cao go. Guan Yu no way. The heart is very upset. Because Guan Yu is fighting with his heart. If he leaves Cao Cao, he will return to Ai Dao. If he leaves Cao Cao, he will leave a bad name. 所以在民和生命两点之间，关羽反复的权衡，最后决定宁可死了，也要留下自己的名声，义的名声。所、so、以 ，after much agonizing， Guan Yu decided to let Cao Cao go。Cao Cao had been his benefactor， Guan Yu had an obligation to him。In the Battle of the Red Cliff, the Allied forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei defeated Cao Cao, but Guan Yu had done something unforgivable. He'd let the enemy go. It's important to understand that in his portrayal of Guan Yu, Luo Guanzhong was both humanizing him and endowing him with the virtues of Confucianism. In violating basic military principles, and putting his personal gratitude ahead of the interests of the alliance, Luo Guanzhong showed that Guan Yu was a man who valued righteousness above all else. All other considerations were secondary to him. In that sense, he embodies Confucius's ideal of the superior man, man who is prepared to do what's right, whatever the consequences to him personally. Guan Yu knew that his life was forfeit if he let Zhao Chao go, but he did it all the same. Readers of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms are left no doubt that Guan Yu represents the essence of the Confucian ideal. So, Guan Yu's ideal, conquerors are welcomed, Zhongjun Da Yi. Jiang Hu is welcomed, Taoyuan Qing Yi. Personal, the people are welcomed, personal honor. These three things are all one thing, and there are three aspects, showing Guan Yu's personal ideal. The author has recognized a personal ideal. So, Guan Yu is first a personal ideal. He is a moral ideal. In 1760, some local officials submitted memorials to Emperor Chen Long of the Qing Dynasty. They pointed out that Guan Yu's posthumous title, Marquis Zhuang Miu, was not equal to his merits and virtues. They suggested changing his title to Shen Yong, meaning extraordinary bravery. After Guan Yu's death, Liu Shan gave him the posthumous title of Marquis of Zhuang Miu, a title meant for a person who didn't live up to his reputation. More than 1,500 years after his death, people were still unhappy about this slur on his reputation. In 1768, Emperor Qian Long decided to change Guan Yu's posthumous title from Zhuang Miu into Shen Yong in all ritual classics and the temples of Guan Yu built by the government. Eight years later, he issued another imperial edict, denouncing Chen Shou's version in Records of the Three Kingdoms as prejudice because his father had been punished by Zhu Liang. 
He ordered that in the complete library in four sections that was then being compiled, the posthumous title of Guan Yu should be changed to Zhong Yi, meaning loyalty and righteousness.那么在历史上那个四号定了以后就是我们常说叫盖棺论定一字定终身是不能够再去改呢北宋以后官宇的四号就发生了很大的变化一直到清代的时候慢慢在变他一开始有侯到公到王到君到地这样一个一个变化的
By the Tang Dynasty, the image of the handsome, righteous, and brave Guan Yu, the warrior who could take on 10,000 men single-handedly, was a well-established poetic trope. At the end of the Northern Song Dynasty, Guan Yu's reputation was so well-established that even more posthumous titles were conferred on him. Even so, iconic figure though he'd become, Guan Yu had a long way to go before he entered the Chinese pantheon. In 219, while Guan Yu was locked in battle with Cao Cao's army in Fancheng, Sun Quan of the Wu state sent Lu Meng, a chief commander, to secretly cross the Yangtze River. They occupied Jianling, where Guan Yu's base camp was located. Guan Yu was under attack front and rear and was forced to withdraw to Mai Chun. Finally run to ground by the Wu army, he died in Danyang, Hubei province. In Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Luo Guanzhong wrote that Guan Yu was 58 years old when he died. As for Guan Yu's final moments, the history books say nothing. All we have to go on is Luo Guanzhong's romanticized version. The great Guan Yu cornered, howling to the sky. The magnificent green dragon crescent blade that had seen him through so much, now dull its magical sheen gone. Decapitated on the orders of Sun Quan, Guan Yu's head was sent to Chao Chao, who buried it with great honors in Luoyang, Henan province. Sun Quan, however, also revered Guan Yu, burying his body with full honors. As the saying goes, head pillowed in Luoyang, body lying in Danyang, soul returned to his ancestral home, three resting places for Guan Yu, mighty hero of the Three Kingdoms. Maybe his soul eventually found refuge here, in the Temple of Guan Yu, in Haizhou, Yuncheng, Shanxi Province, his birthplace. In the aftermath of Guan Yu's demise, Sun Quan occupied most of Jingzhou. Consequently, the Shu state lost land and population that it could ill afford to lose. Zhuge Liang's strategy of retaining Jingzhou and Yizhou at the same time was shattered. The loss of Jingzhou may be attributed to many causes, not least Guan Yu's arrogance and inability to comprehend the overall strategic situation. In Chen Shou's opinion, Guan Yu's arrogance and other shortcomings made failure inevitable. So it's perhaps ironic that a general who was defeated and killed in battle ended up being deified and worshipped across the country as the personification of the soldierly virtues of bravery and honor, overshadowing even Liu Bei and Sun Quan. Because of that, many historians are perplexed by the Guan Yu and his enduring reputation. In Conversation on Chinese History by the Hudson River, historian Ray Huang wrote that Guan Yu didn't know his subordinates well, misjudged his enemy's situation, and was careless with his flanks, leading his army into danger. Unaware of his own shortcomings as leader, morale in Guan Yu's army plummeted, in the end collapsing with barely a struggle. Yet bizarrely, Despite the definite historical track record, Chinese people still came to regard Guan Yu as their god of war. Surely the gap between Guan Yu, the real life leader, and Guan Yu, the legend, is something that is crying out to be explained.
Zhao Yi, a Qing Dynasty historian, raised similar questions in his own book. He wrote that usually hero worship of this sort lasts a few centuries after the death of the hero. If that's the case, then Guan Yu represents a strange exception. Before the Tang Dynasty, he was largely ignored. Ever since, his reputation has gone from strength to strength. Zhuda 一个人成功了，大家都说的好；一个人失败了，说那个家伙我早就看他不顺眼，总有一天要再跟他过，永远不行，是吧？比比皆是。但是关羽的形象上发生的一些变化，人们没有以成败的英雄。As everyone knows, in the romance of the three kingdoms, Luo Guanzhong didn't skate over Guan Yu's military failures and character flaws. On the contrary. There's a strong note of moral criticism in his depictions of the conflict between Guan Yu and the Wu state. As Mao Zongang, a Qing dynasty critic, remarked, it was the Wu state that broke the alliance with the Shu state in the first place. Guan Yu's response was excessive, and Liu Meng resorted to trickery, directly resulting in the loss of Jingzhou. Guan Yu's reputation rests entirely on his moral conduct his moral superiority, as conceived in Confucian terms, not his strengths as a military leader. Luo Guanzhong's achievement in the romance was to use the historical material to create a character who could not be judged purely on the basis of success or failure, effectively overthrowing a system of values that placed too much emphasis on worldly success. In this way, he elevated Guan Yu to a more spiritual plane laying the foundations for his immortality. In the end, Luo Guanzhong's Guan Yu made a final appearance from beyond the grave, returning to wreak vengeance on Liu Meng. In the process, his ghost startled even Chao Chao. Perhaps Guan Yu's disembodied last bow made his deification inevitable. But the process by which Guan Yu was transformed from a man into a god was a complicated one. One of the stories goes that in 592, Master Zhu Yi, originator of the Tiantai sect of Buddhism, returned to his hometown, Jingzhu. There he established a temple on Yu Quan Mountain, applying Bodhisattva precepts to Guan Yu's soul. So it was that in addition to his posthumous titles, Guan Yu was posthumously converted to Buddhism. A hundred years later, Master Shen Xiu of the Chan sect arrived at Yu Quan Mountain and constructed a temple as well, making Guan Yu a guardian deity. From then on, stories about Guan Yu's holy powers proliferated, transforming him from a historical figure into a religious one. But Taoism, China's native religion, wanted in on the act too. During the Song Dynasty, rumor had it that in Haizhou of Shanxi province, Guan Yu's hometown, the yield of the salt pond dropped for some unknown reason. According to the heavenly master Zhang Qixian, this was caused by the god Qiyo. Naturally, when told this, Emperor Huizong asked, who can defeat him? Guan Yu. I have already told him to do it," answered Zhang Qishan. Soon enough, the yield of the salt pond was back to normal. Impressed, Emperor Huizong, a devout Taoist, made Guan Yu 
into immortal of lofty peace. In the Ming Dynasty, Emperor Shen Zong, who was also a devout Taoist, conferred another title on Guan Yu, Emperor Xiatian. Xiatian means assisting the heaven. In the following years, he bestowed higher and higher honors on Guan Yu. By 1614, Guan Yu had become the imperial sovereign Sait Guan, great emperor who defeats the demons of the three realms and heavenly lord known from afar for his divine power. Yapujin 他的越来越突出的这种状态 Thanks to the unremitting efforts of Emperor Hui Zong of Song, Guan Yu finally had a temple of his own. In 20 years, the emperor had heaped honors on him. In the Tang Dynasty, the dominant figure in temples to the god of war had been Zhang Ziya, and Guan Yu was only one of the 64 subordinate generals. Temples of Guan Yu, where Guan Yu was the dominant figure, appeared during the reign of Emperor Chen Song of Sun. After Zhu Yanzhang became the emperor of the Ming Dynasty, he had a temple dedicated to the god of war, constructed in Nanjing in 1394. Zhang Ziya was taken out and the temple of Guan Yu replaced it as one of the nine temples of the capital. In 1665, in the Qing Dynasty, Guan Yu's status was promoted again, and he was afforded the same status as Confucius. In 1730, Guan Yu was honored as the Saint of War, with the Temple of Guan Yu regarded on the same level as the Confucian Temple. The spirit of Guan Yu, honored in Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, as well as by the Shu state, the Song and Ming dynasties was reborn 1,000 years after his death. The Temple of Guan Yu in his hometown, Haizhou of Shangji Province, was the first built in the Sui Dynasty. It was expanded and rebuilt in the Song and Ming dynasties. It covers a total of 220,000 square meters and has over 200 rooms. It is the largest existing palace-style Taoist architectural complex. It is regarded as the ancestor of all temples of Guan Yu. Upon arrival, civilian officials had to get out of their sedan chairs and military officers had to dismount. There are three temple gates. While the Zhu gate in the center was reserved for emperors, the Wenjing gate in the east was for officials, and the Wu Wei gate in the west for military officers. Inside the temple are countless plaques offered by people from all walks of life. The inscriptions on some boards were handwritten by emperors. Emperors Kung Shi, Chen Long, and Shen Feng all praised Guan Yu's righteousness and bravery. For over a thousand years, people of all classes praised Guan Yu. In all China's long history, 
Guan Yu is unique in being honored so widely and for so long. Xu Wei, a Ming Dynasty scholar, once remarked that the temples of Guan Yu could be found all over the country. According to him, the acceptance of Guan Yu as a deity and Confucian ideal were equally accepted wherever you went in China. These core beliefs were part of what it meant to be Chinese. But while Confucian temples could only be found in prefectural capitals and county seats, temples of Guan Yu abounded. From the largest city to the tiniest village, every settlement had a Guan Yu temple. The popularity of Guan Yu was simply unprecedented. And nor was it restricted to soldiers and military men people in fields as varied as tobacco, joss stick and candle production, even education, all worshipped him. Belief in Guan Yu literally spanned the country. In the Ming Dynasty, all the main passes through the Great Wall had a temple of Guan Yu. Whether setting out for battle or returning, Guan Yu was there to greet his fellow soldiers. These three stone tablets from the Qing Dynasty are still standing in this ancient building. Bearing 18 rules of conduct agreed on by the merchants of the town, it was placed here in 1785. It's significant that they chose to take the oath to abide by this pledge in the Temple of Guan Yu. Clearly, they all believed that a promise made under Guan Yu's stern gaze was a promise that would be kept. A rough translation of the inscription on the tablet reads, People are not as honest as they used to be. Rules are being neglected. All the merchants are worried. Therefore, we have gathered here to agree on rules to keep men honest. Adhering to these 18 rules will be to everyone's benefit. Win-win.